Hi, and uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Chris Tapp. I'm chairman of the Mizzou C++ Working Group and a technical specialist at LDRA, where I specialize in programming standards. Uh, today, I'd like to talk just a little bit about dynamic memory, what its uh, impact it has on software, when it can cause us problems, uh, and also the fact that sometimes we may end up using dynamic memory when we, we don't think we are actually using it. Uh, so a little bit of an introduction, uh, then look at uh, what the issues are with dynamic memory, how it's used within C++, uh, what can be done if a project does actually need to use dynamic memory allocation, uh, and also uh, look at some possible ways of detecting accidental or unintentional use of dynamic memory, uh, which can sometimes happen when working with C++ code. Uh, as a bit of an introduction, uh, it, there are quite a few uh, um, standards, so, so the sort of higher level functional safety standards suggest that dynamic memory should not be used uh, when implementing safety critical code. Uh, they often cite concerns such as memory starvation, running out of memory, uh, the non-deterministic allocation and deallocation times um, that we can get from some of the memory allocation uh, libraries. However, it, it's not always that simple. It, it, sometimes it's not realistic when using languages such as C++ uh, to simply say that dynamic memory um, should not be used because the language itself will use it uh, even if the programmer doesn't put explicit calls to memory allocation uh, within the code. So then what we have to start thinking about is if we do have to live with dynamic memory and use of dynamic memory, what can be done to help mitigate some of these concerns that exist with its use? So coming back again to these, these safety standards, they generally are going to restrict or prohibit the use of dynamic memory. Uh, and that's really due to a number of risks that are associated with its use. So for example, fairly common one is that memory may not be available when it's needed uh, because either it's all in use or it perhaps hasn't been released something is holding on to memory when it shouldn't be uh, the real issue with this from sort of functional safety point of view is it's generally going to be undecidable when this is going to happen so we're not going to know in advance uh, if a program is or is not going to run out of memory um, the other issues that we can run into is that the pool of free memory that is available to, to the application may become fragmented. Uh, and what that means is that it may not be possible to allocate a block of, of a particular size that we need, even though in theory there is enough free space still available within the system. Uh, and finally, we also have to uh, worry about the time that the operating system or the runtime uh, is going to take to actually allocate a block of memory. In some cases, that time is not going to be deterministic, uh, especially when fragmentation has taken place uh, and that the, the free memory is not all uh, in, in one nice block and some sort of uh, allocation um, routine is going to have to sift through various bits of memory to try and find something of suitable size. If we are working with uh, within a hard real-time environment, then obviously any sort of non-deterministic or very variable uh, timings within the memory allocation can have an impact on real-time performance. Uh, it is worth noting that some of these issues um, possibly don't show up in a system that is only running for short periods of time. And that really just comes down to if you have a system that's turned on and off fairly regularly, uh, it's possible uh, that memory leaks and fragmentation may be taking place within the code, but they don't show up because they don't get to a point where they can cause a problem before the system is restarted. An example of that uh, would be maybe a car, uh, which is often only going to be used for a few hours at a time before the engine is switched off, uh, and then the car is restarted next time it's used. So looking at uh, out-of-memory issues, um, as I said, it's generally not going to be possible to predict when an out-of-memory event is going to occur. Uh, and what that means is it can make it very difficult to reason that there is going to be enough memory available under all the operating conditions that we have in the system. Uh, and that there are two uh, sort of main scenarios where this can happen. In one case, it, we may be able to prove that there is going to be enough memory, even if memory is never deallocated. Uh, and what that means is if we're not deallocating memory, we don't have to worry about um, allocation failures because we are sure there's always going to be enough memory. We don't have to worry about dying pointers or double freeze uh, where any deallocation 
may not be done appropriately because we're not going to have any uh, deallocation within the code. It's also possible that there will be insufficient memory if deallocation is not used at runtime. However, if we then do start freeing memory uh, as the system is running, it's likely to become non-trivial to prove that there will be enough memory, um, especially as fragmentation may occur. Um, so it, it can become very difficult to start reasoning about the memory footprint uh, at any particular instance in time when the system is operational. If we do need to have memory de deallocation, then we can start to think about how, how deallocation is going to be managed. Uh, it could possibly be done explicitly, so we will have explicit calls to free or, or delete uh, within the code. Um, if we do that, there, there is then a risk of, uh, sort of premature release. Uh, in other words, we may have dangling pointers where something has freed a block of memory but there is still some part of the code base that is expecting the pointers to be valid. Uh, we can also end up with memory leaks where we, we fail to release blocks of memory when they're no longer in use. Uh, and we can also start to run into uh, double free errors uh, where two bits of code attempt to release the same piece of memory at different times. Uh, we can also manage deallocation through the use of something like smart pointers uh, and within C++ um, that, that's considered to be best practice. A lot of these risks uh, are not likely to be present in the code uh, because the, the operating system through the smart pointers that language provides are, are going to take care of making sure that there are no double freeze, that there are no memory leaks uh, and what have you. It, it is still possible to have errors in the code, but it, it is much more difficult if smart pointers are used appropriately, uh, especially when um, you start making sure that ownership of pointers uh, is handled within those smart pointers so you can have unique pointers or shared pointers. There are however some code and runtime costs associated with the use of smart pointers uh, and obviously that, that also needs to be taken into consideration. The real problem uh, that we have is this lack of predictability when memory is potentially going to run out in the system uh, and that does make it hard to design appropriate out of memory fallback behavior within the code base uh, because we don't know if we're going to have enough for say one object or a thousand objects uh, it, it becomes much more difficult to try and design suitable fallback behavior so looking at uh, memory fragmentation um this is this really uh, manifests itself as as increasing the probability of, of out of memory events occurring, and really that's because it's possible that any of the free blocks that exist within the fragmented memory pool uh, may be too small to satisfy a request, even though in theory there is more than enough memory uh, to to satisfy the request. Uh, it can also have a negative impact on allocation and deallocation times uh, as it does take longer to search the free list and, and possibly uh, an in-use list um, to see if the discarded blocks are available for, or can be reused. Uh, fragmentation is a real concern for systems that are intended to run for long periods of time. Uh, as it's likely that fragmentation within, within the memory is going to become worse over time. Uh, and it's more likely you're going to get a situation where you may have very little memory actually allocated or committed within the application, uh, but that all the pieces that are available are too small to satisfy any requests that are needed later on. Typically, when a system starts up, you're going to have all the memory is going to be free. Uh, and as the program runs, we're going to have storage is allocated for a number of blocks of varying sizes as, as the application uh, goes about its jobs. Uh, we're also going to be uh, freeing blocks uh, if we are allowing memory to be deallocated as well. Uh, and what that means is that if we have an allocation request received later on in time so for example if we have a, a request come in for a block of length four um, the memory map shows that there is enough free memory uh, there are seven blocks free but the largest contiguous block only has a length of three and that means we are not able to satisfy a request for a 
block with length of four. So we're going to end up with an allocation failure um, with, with the um, application being told there is insufficient memory available. Um, this is a sort of fairly simple view of how allocation deallocation works uh, in the real world. Um, the allocators within um, sort of runtimes are, are much more complicated. Uh, and they, they will try to do clever things like coalescing blocks to try and increase the chances of uh, successful allocation later on. Uh, but uh, even that isn't going to give a, a perfect solution. Uh, and also, the more complicated these allocators and deallocators are, the longer they are likely to take at runtime. Uh, and that's where we come on to the, the non-deterministic allocation time. Constant allocation time is obviously something that we are going to prefer uh, within a hard real-time system, as it's going to make it much easier to model the, um, the, the sort of scheduling deadline compliance of the code, so we can guarantee that our, our real-time loops are going to carry on running at the frequency they are expected. However, as soon as we start to have calls to, to malloc within the code, there is the chance that we may have widely varying allocation times. Uh, for example, the, the memory allocation routines may need to go and search a list of previously allocated blocks uh, that may be used in use or in free, depending on how it's managing these lists. Uh, and it has to search through these to try and find a large enough block that is free uh, for Malloc to return. Uh, the problem we then have is we can end up with, with the allocation taking even longer. And if this fails to find a block of memory, um, the, the allocation routine may make a call to SBRK or sort of similar operating system routine to try and request memory from the operating system if the application itself doesn't have a free block that it, it, it still has access to. Uh, and once again, that's an, an additional call, which means that the allocation time can become even longer in some cases. Uh, it is also possible that an allocation uh, call may stall if we're working in a multi-thread environment, uh, and that's down to the fact that general case uh, memory allocators are going to be single-threaded. So if multiple threads are requesting memory at the same time, uh, several other threads are going to have to be blocked until the current allocation has been completed. So fragmentation can have a major impact on, on allocation time uh, as the free list may be long, which means obviously that it's going to take longer to search. Uh, and there is also this risk that there's no guarantee that there will actually be a free block available, or if there is, it may not be big enough uh, to actually satisfy the, the allocation request. If we look at um, how C++ works with dynamic memory allocation, uh, we, we obviously have allocation that's initiated at the request of the user, so typically it's going to be through the use of new um, and possibly the, the malloc functions. It is worth noting that the raw pointers returned by these uh, these functions or routines uh, should ideally be managed using smart pointers to help reduce these chances of uh, memory leaks and, and double free errors uh, and the other common errors that can be introduced into code when dynamic memory is being used. Uh, in terms of the, the language itself, uh, there is quite a lot of memory allocation within the standard template library in C++ that takes place uh, without any explicit interaction from the user. Uh, so for example, if we're using something like uh, std string, dynamic memory is going to be allocated behind the scenes within the, within the constructors uh, and various other methods within the std string, except there, the, when we initialize a string uh, with a small string and something called the small string optimization takes place, uh, in, in which case it, it is possible to allocate a std string without any dy dynamic memory allocation taking place. Uh, but if it is then increased in length later on, then some dynamic memory allocation is going to take place. Similarly, std vector is, is probably going to be using dynamic memory, except there, there, there is another case there where uh, if a std vector uses a default construct or is default constructed, then there is no memory allocation until something else happens. Uh, and similarly, um, std function, uh, std any, uh, um, once again, that tends to only be for large objects because for smaller objects, 
the compilers managed to allocate storage um, just using the, the stack and there is no dynamic allocation but it's very difficult to predict when or if that is going to happen uh, with, with all these containers we're going to get dynamic memory allocation taking place if uh, an increase in container size is required uh, and typically there's going to be a copy made uh, information copied across uh, between the copies and then the original copy will be uh, released back to the memory pool uh, exceptions can also require the use of dynamic memory allocation so for example if we were to throw a std runtime error um, that is going to require dynamic memory allocation but the only exception that's guaranteed not to is std bad alloc because it would not have made sense for the memory allocation uh, there is no memory uh, error not to be reportable because there wasn't any memory left available to report that error uh, so the compilers uh, are required to manage that as a special sort of case uh, there, there are lots of other cases where c++ uh, may use dynamic memory um, there's a link to a, a, a github project uh, that i put on the bottom of that slide uh, that just shows uh, a few more cases if anybody is interested in some more Coming back to, to the real world when we're writing code, we may have to use dynamic memory. So if we do, what are we going to do about it? How can we manage it? In, in the general case, it's not going to be possible to know at compile time how much memory we are going to need. So for example, if we had a, a radar system uh, that needs to be able to track an unspecified number of targets concurrently, we may not have an upper bound on the memory um, that uh, is likely to cause us a problem um, when we're trying to initiate target tracks. The system design itself does need to be able to work within a specific limited memory footprint. Um, so it may be that there is an upper limit on the number of active tracks, even if it's not known. Um, so in other words, there, there is going to have to be some um, constraint within the design to limit the number of tracks. Uh, if we do have a, a limited number uh, of resources or, or tracks within our design, that means that a strategy has to be put in place to manage them if they become exhausted. So for example, uh, it may be that there are more potential targets than could be actively tracked within the memory footprint that has been allocated to the system design. So the design itself needs to implement a strategy to allow for that scenario. Uh, one thing that we can consider using are, are things called uh, memory allocation pools uh, and, and what they can do is they can help us to mitigate uh, sort of out of memory and fragmentation issues which as I said earlier generally result in or manifest as uh, out of memory events uh, and, and they can also help us to ensure that we, we have deterministic allocation times within the code if we're using memory pools they, they are generally going to be created during program startup uh, they are sized for the worst case memory footprint that we permitted during system operation so for example again in target trackers the pool will have a footprint big enough to allocate the maximum number of concurrent target trackers that are required by the design documents the advantage of memory pools is that the number of available blocks within the pool is known at compile time uh, and that means that out of memory behavior can be made predictable so for example uh, we can introduce a strategy to start dropping stale or outdated tracks more aggressively when for example more than 90 percent of the track trackers are actively in use uh, we can start being more selective when we're creating new tracks so only creating new tracks when we have high quality data uh, and just playing around with various various thresholds within the, the sort of tracker code itself to try and manage uh, the number of tracks we have with, uh, to make sure that we do not exceed the memory footprint that is available. As I said, the, the number of blocks that we have within a pool is known at compile time, uh, and that means we can make sure that we can guarantee that there will be sufficient source resources always available. So for example, if we have a specification that says we must be able to track n targets concurrently we can ensure that we have a memory pool that will always satisfy that requirement uh, we can also uh, enforce an upper bound uh, on task memory usage uh, which does mean that if, if we have a pool of memory that's shared across a number of tasks 
each of those tasks can be much more resource friendly. Uh, and, and that means that we're not going to use up all the memory uh, creating, uh, for example, or tracks uh, at the expense of reducing the amount of available memory to other tasks that may also need to have a, a significant amount of memory allocated to them. Uh, we can also, within the pool, uh, we can also uh, report some statistics. So we could, for example, uh, report peak uh, current uh, memory use uh, so that uh, we can log how, how the memory is being used within the system. It also makes it easier for us to define how the system will behave in the presence of memory exhaustion. So, for example, we, we could have this degraded performance of so more aggressive pr pruning of stale tracks and selective track initiation. Memory pools can, can also provide some additional checks on, on the use of memory. So, for example, um, if a pointer is to be freed, uh, the, the pool can actually validate that it, it is a valid pointer within the pool. So, for example, making sure that it points to a, a known block within the pool. Uh, we can also introduce guards to prevent uh, multiple free events. It's difficult to decide what, necessarily what to do if we do detect that, but at least we have the ability to say uh, a free request has been received, but this block of memory is not currently allocated. Uh, so it, once again, we can then design some more intelligent error handling to deal with these sort of events. Uh, as mentioned before, we can also have these pool statistics. So we, we could at runtime monitor how the pool is behaving. Uh, pools also allow um, sort of thread memory allocations to be isolated. We can, we can have uh, memory pools allocated to e each thread. Uh, so we don't have any uh, interference between threads in terms of blocking, waiting for another one to allocate memory, or one thread using all the memory uh, and not leaving any available for other threads. Uh, we can also consider using different types of pools. So, for example, we may have some pools for, for objects of the same size. So, so, if we have a load of objects that have a size of less than 32 bytes, uh, we can use a single pool manager to deal with those, even if the objects are, are not necessarily the same type. On the other hand, we can also have pools uh, that start to or specialize uh, in dealing with objects of particular types. So, for example, we could have tra tracker objects. Uh, I'd have those all stored within a pool. Uh, this is an example of a, a sort of possible sort of pool allocator. Uh, this is this is not necessarily complete or correct. It's just a, a little uh, sort of sketch, uh, really, just to put on a slide here. Uh, and what, what we have here is we have an allocation and a deallocation function and some persistent storage that's used for these. The, the way this is set up, we use this uh, free list um, array. Uh, and that, that basically just holds the array elements uh, of all the memory blocks within the pool that are free. Uh, and by using a, a list like this, uh, we can get exactly the same allocation and deallocation time, regardless of how much the pool is used or, or how fragmented it becomes. So when is dynamic memory sensible? When, it, when is it the best thing for us to be using? Well. As I said, there is a lot of belief out there that um, you shouldn't necessarily be using dynamic mem memory all the time that the system is active, but it is quite often considered to be acceptable for dynamic memory to be used during system startup. And what we then do is when the system enters an operational state, um, which it will only do uh, if there are no issues uh, during startups. In other words, we have fail safe behavior, the program starts up, we allocate and deallocate memory, uh, and we, we then get to a point where we can either commit to an operational state if all our memory allocation has gone as expected, or we can commit uh, to a sort of fail safe state uh, if there were some issues uh, with the dynamic memory during system startup. The important thing here, here is that allocation and deallocation are only permitted during system startup, but not once we have entered uh, an operational state. Uh, and what this does is this allows, uh, for example, the creation of pools with a size uh, that is still potentially dynamically determined at runtime. Um, so the memory footprint can still be flexible, but it does mean that we have this ability to commit to an operational state only when we are certain that all the systems 
or, or subsystems within within the system itself uh, are able to satisfy their minimum memory requirements. So it is worth remembering that memory allocation can incur implicitly, especially within C++. Uh, so we do need to try and make sure that this doesn't happen at runtime. Um, within C++, it is possible to replace the default memory allocators that the containers used. Uh, and we do that providing a sort of custom implementation of uh, std allocator. Uh, if we do do that, that could be written to make use of a memory pool. Um, we would still have to worry about fragmentation issues uh, as they are still potentially a concern uh, when we are inserting uh, into the sum of co the containers that the language provides. Uh, and if we do do that, we're, we're going to get to that. We, we potentially need blocks that are going to be big enough to hold both the old and the new content uh, as the uh, container is resized. Um, it, it is also possible uh, to look at writing containers uh, which are, are more pool friendly. Uh, so design your own containers, but in a way that will then work much more efficiently with the pools uh, so that fragmentation issues are, are likely to be less of a concern. So how do we detect unintentional use uh, of memory allocation? And as I said, the, 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 some of these uses may be implicit within the language. Uh, we can detect these at, at runtime, uh, and one way of doing that is possibly by overloading operator new and operator delete. Uh, and what we've really done here is we've just added an extra bit of code in there to say that uh, if we are in an operational state, uh, we're going to do something like throw std bad alloc if we try to allocate new memory, or, or we could possibly call std terminate within uh, the delete if memory is being freed when we're not expecting it to be. Uh, obviously, it's up to a system to design what is an appropriate behavior in those cases. Uh, and what these overloads do is that they enforce this principle of only allowing unrestricted use of allocation and deallocation during system startup, uh, and they prevent any further use once the system has gone operational. Uh, within this sort of little uh, snippet here uh, within main uh, we have this memory state operational uh, creation of that, that ob of that object uh, locks the memory allocation within the system uh, and what that means is that uh, within main we, we have this vector that we've created that's got storage for three ints uh, if we try and push a fourth int onto the the back of this vector uh, the operator new is going to end up throwing a a bad alloc exception um, so that we're, we're catching the fact that we have tried to allocate memory when we weren't expecting to because we're in an operational state. Um, th this is all relatively easy to live with in terms of code because the deallocation is still going to work as expected uh, and that's because this memory state object that we have uh, is a RAII object uh, and it will be deleted uh, before any destructor calls are made. Uh, so that means that the operational state uh, within the memory allocator, that restriction is lifted uh, before the stack unwinding and, and object deallocation uh, starts to take place uh, within the language itself. So that means that the operator deletes are then going to work correctly and not cause the program to terminate unexpectedly. Um, the, the only slight restriction uh, with this sort of approach is that any exceptions that are used are going to have to be non-allocating, um, otherwise they, they are going to uh, potentially cause operator new to throw bad alloc if they occur when we are operational. So just a, a few things to consider if we are using dynamic memory. Uh, firstly, is it going to be possible for us to fix the maximum memory uh, that's used at compile time or during the startup phase? Is it going to be possible for us to use more CPU time to enforce memory correctness through the use of smart pointers or other techniques? Uh, can memory fragmentation be mitigated by only running the system for short periods? Can memory pools be used to make memory use more efficient, for example, when objects have to uh, a set of fixed sizes? Uh, and 
Finally, uh, does the system have any hard real-time constraints that have to be satisfied that may have an impact on the allocators that are used? So to conclude, it's worth saying it's not practical for large-scale C++ programs to avoid the use of dynamic memory, uh, especially uh, as we've seen um, it can occur implicitly within the way the language works itself. So if safety is a concern within our project, then outer memory and determinism issues need to be considered design time. So we could possibly look at memory pools to prevent fragmentation and unexpected allocation failures. Uh, we can plan failure uh, behavior, uh, introduce some sort of degraded performance if memory runs out within the system or gets low within the system. We can also apply different policies during startup phase and operational phase of the system. Uh, and we can enforce detection of accidental use of dynamic memory. And, and finally, just a few links to some uh, additional reading on this. Uh, the CodePlay document um, shows how uh, sorts of, sort of memory managers are used within sort of gaming environments where very fast high performance memory allocators are required. Uh, there's a talk um, at a C++ conference on stud allocator, which is, which is quite interesting. Uh, and the final one is just a paper on malloc that shows how complicated some of the memory allocators are that are used within C and C++. Thank you. Um, please do get in touch with us at LDRA uh, if there's any information that you need.